order in a humane, orderly, and fair manner and carry out its truly wide-ranging responsibilities. Secretary Americus, I'm interested in hearing from you today, as we all are, about the pressing funding needs of your department. I hope that all of our colleagues will work with us to meet those needs, because, you know, our economy really depends on our ability to ensure that countless goods, as well as people, can move through our borders in a safe, orderly, and timely way. And our security depends on our ability to do all of that while effectively stopping threats like drug smugglers and fentanyl, sex and labor traffickers, not to mention cyber attacks are the very real and growing threat of white supremacy. And as we do all of this, we've got to make sure uh, we do the utmost to make sure people are being treated humanely and continue our long tradition of welcoming people from across the world who are seeking safety from persecution or conflict and opportunities for a better life. This is vital to us as, uh, as our reputation as the leader of the free world and land of opportunity, and because, as we have seen throughout history, immigrants do make our nation stronger. So we look forward to your testimony today and the opportunity to ask you questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chair Murray. Senator Britt. Um, Chair Murphy, before I start, just a point of personal privilege. Um, need to give you a public congratulations. Our two teams faced off in the final four. I am incredibly proud of the Crimson Tide and uh, all of the players and the uh, positive impact they made both on the tournament and have for the state. Uh, everybody from uh, Grant Nelson, who John Hoven always tells me is from North Dakota. Dakota. He, does, he doesn't let me forget that. Nick Pringle, Mark Sears, Mark Sears' mom, who may be our true MVP. Um, but Nate Oates did an incredible job. But at the end of the day, obviously, you all came out victorious, uh, not only in the Final Four, but in the tournament for the second year in a row. Uh, pretty incredible. So while I'll never miss an opportunity to say Roll Tide, I have to tip my hat and say congratulations and go Huskies. Well, and, and Alabama, to their credit, gave us our closest game in two years. Excellent. We only beat you by 14 points. <laughs> there you so, go. Right. We'll take it. We'll be back. We'll be back next year. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for testifying today. I am pleased that we were able to avoid a year-long continuing resolution when it came to the FY24 Homeland Security Appropriations Bill. The FY24 bill took incremental steps to start moving away from merely managing the border crisis created under this administration and actually included significant steps to strengthen our border security and immigration enforcement on our nation's interior and right there at the border. In particular, um, it was great to see the FY24 24 funding for over 2,000 new Border Patrol agents, as well as additional ports of entry officers and ICE officers. The final bill also importantly included a 22% increase in detention beds. A major increase in funding for removal operations was also um, something I was pleased to see. Disappointingly, President Biden's FY25 budget request for the Department of Homeland Security does not follow this model, and instead repeats the same mistakes of his previous budget request. Once again, his, this administration has proposed cutting the DHS base budget. The FY25 presidential budget request would cut base DHS funding by more than $1.25 billion, a reduction of 2% from the FY24 levels. At a time when our country undoubtedly faces a national security and a humanitarian crisis of historic proportions at our southern border, this is completely nonsensical. Considering that President Biden has proposed increasing the EPA budget by roughly 20%, it clearly shows where this administration's priorities are. It is clear that this administration's budget request in recent years are designed to merely manage the border crisis it created and will not actually solve the problem. Nor will border policy legislation that doesn't take away President Biden's ability to continue to abuse tools and loopholes that fuel and facilitate the entry of inadmissible aliens into the United States, including the unprecedented abuse of the presidential parole authority. The truth is, is that we have a president who could take executive action, and if he wanted to, he would. If reports that we're seeing today are accurate, the president has finally, after over 1,100 days, 
and to his administration, admitted that he does have the authority. Unfortunately, rather than reversing course, this inadequate budget request for the Department of Homeland Security only doubles down on the failed policies of the last three years. Across the board, the administration is failing to put its money where it matters. This includes the ongoing fentanyl crisis. Fentanyl is responsible for more than 200 deaths every single day and is the number one cause of death for Americans ages 18 through 45. I want to commend the brave men and women of CBP, ICE, and the U.S. Coast Guard who are on the front lines each and every day to interdict fentanyl and other deadly drugs. But the numbers are increasingly shocking. In FY23, ICE Homeland Security investigations seized nearly 42,000 pounds of fentanyl, while CBP seized an additional 27 pounds of fentanyl, almost all of it at the southern border. These numbers are roughly double the amount seized in the previous year. While President Biden's budget request includes many references to commitment to countering fentanyl, its actual funding request is sorely lacking. The request includes no new funding for non-intrusive invasion um, inspection equipment at ports of entry and only marginally new investments, um, increases marginally new investments for counter fentanyl labs, technology, and staffing. The cartels continue to evolve their activities to stay ahead of our best efforts, and a budget that makes only minimal new investment to combat fentanyl will fail to make the progress we need in order to protect American families and communities from this poison. Mr. Secretary, for the fourth year in a row, this administration has submitted a Homeland Security budget that fails to provide sufficient resources to allow the men and women of the department to protect our nation and the many threats it faces. At a time when migrant encounters continue to set record after record, when the number of migrants released into the interior of the United States is overwhelming, the ability of local communities to absorb them, and when fentanyl and dangerous criminals continue to flood our nation and kill our citizens, it is unacceptable that this administration's response is to <laughs> cut base funding for the Department of Homeland Security. I look forward to working with the department and my colleagues on the Appropriations Committee to enact a budget for FY25 that builds on the steps taken in FY24 to strengthen our border security, increase immigration enforcement, and crack down on the cartels that are trafficking these substances into our country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Britt. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Mayorkas for your opening comments. Chairs Murphy and Murray, Ranking Member Britt, distinguished members of this committee. Every day, the 268,000 men and women of the Department of Homeland Security carry out our mission to protect the safety and security of the American people. They protect our shores, harbors, skies, cyberspace, borders, and leaders. They stop fentanyl and other deadly drugs from entering our country. They lead the response to maritime emergencies. As we speak, they are engaged in the response to the tragic Francis, Ski Cot Bri Francis Ski Scott Key Bridge collapse in Baltimore. They help communities recover and rebuild after a natural disaster. They combat the scourges of human trafficking, forced labor, and online child sexual exploitation, and so much more. All this despite a perennially insufficient budget. The dedicated public servants of DHS deserve full support, and the American people deserve the results a fully resourced DHS can deliver. The funding opportunities outlined in the President's fiscal year 2025 budget for DHS are critical to meeting both goals. I welcome the opportunity to discuss this proposed budget and highlight some of its key proposals with you today. When our department was founded in the wake of 9-11, the threat of foreign terrorism against high visibility targets was our primary concern. That foreign terrorist threat persists and the U.S. continues to be in a heightened threat environment. We now also confront the terrorism-related threat of radicalized home loan offenders and small groups already resident here in the United States. This budget provides for an $80 million increase to our department's nonprofit security grant program and additional funds for targeted violence and terrorism prevention grants so that DHS can better help communities prevent tra tragedies from occurring. As loan actors in nation states increasingly target our critical infrastructure and our data, the President's budget provides CISA with needed funding to improve our cybersecurity and resiliency. Fentanyl 
is wreaking tragedy in communities across the country. DHS has interdicted more illicit fentanyl and arrested more individuals for fentanyl-related crimes in the last two fiscal years than in the previous five combined. We must do more. The President's budget includes critical funding to advance our strategy, including funds for non-intrusive inspection technology and targeted operations. During a time when the world, including our hemisphere, is experiencing the greatest displacement of people since World War II, DHS has toughened our border enforcement and is maximizing our available resources and authorities. In the last 11 months, we have removed or returned more than 630,000 individuals who did not have a legal basis to stay, more than in every full fiscal year since 2013. The President's budget would further expand these efforts. It provides $25.9 billion for CBP and ICE, including funds for hiring more enforcement personnel. A separate $265 million would be used by USCIS to bolster refugee processing as we continue to expand lawful pathways and ensure that protection remains accessible for those who qualify under our laws. Our immigration system, however, is fundamentally broken, including our asylum system that so significantly impacts the security of our borders and the processes we administer at them. Only Congress can fix our broken and outdated system, and only Congress can address our need for more Border Patrol agents, asylum officers, and immigration judges, facilities, and technology. Our administration worked closely with a bipartisan group of senators to reach agreement on a national security supplemental package, one that would make the system changes that are needed and give DHS the tools and resources needed to meet today's border security challenges. We remain ready to work with you to pass this tough, fair, bipartisan agreement. Finally, extreme weather continues to devastate communities. And let me turn, if I may, for a moment, um, chairs and ranking member Brett, uh, to Senators Kennedy and Hyde-Smith. Um, I am tracking very closely the extreme weather that has struck both Louisiana and Mississippi, flooding in Mississippi, a tornado um, touching down in Slidell, Louisiana, and our FEMA personnel are ready to deploy as the needs of your um, constituents so require. Last year, FEMA responded to more than 100 disasters. Our budget provides $22.7 billion to assist community leaders and help survivors in the aftermath of major disasters and additional funds to invest in resilient strategies that will save lives and taxpayer money in the decades to come. Essential to our success across all mission sets is our department's ability to recruit and retain a world-class workforce. In addition to the frontline border workforce I mentioned, the President's budget includes $1.5 billion to maintain our commitment to fairly compensate the TSA workforce, continuing the long overdue fiscal year 2023 initiative we work together to implement. I look forward to further discussing these critical missions and our department's needs for both the coming and current fiscal years. The recently passed 2024 budget, though welcome and helpful to many of our operations, was enacted too late to implement an appreciable hiring surge. It reduced by 20% much needed support for cities dealing with migrant related challenges, and it cut critical research and development funding, the compounding effects of which our department will feel for years. I am eager to work with you to address these and other shortfalls in the weeks ahead, as I am eager to deliver together the sustained funding, resources, and support that the extraordinarily talented and dedicated public servants of DHS need and deserve. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for your comments. We will begin rounds of uh, five-minute questions. I'll begin. Um, I have first a personnel question for you. Um, Jeff Rezmovich was nominated to be the chief financial officer of DHS last year. His nomination has been pending for some time before the Senate. Of course, his nomination is especially important to the Appropriations Committee. It doesn't make a lot of sense to have an agency this large without a CFO for this long. Uh, I assume you would agree with me that uh, his uh, confirmation, uh, the ability to get a CFO working with you at the department is of the utmost importance. It most certainly is, um, uh, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, I have worked very closely uh, with Jeff Resmovic for uh, about seven years now, um, previously when I was a deputy secretary, and let me say unequivocally that he is pure gold as a public servant. I should also note uh, that the woman over my left shoulder, Ann Tipton, who is serving uh, as our chief financial officer, is also pure gold. We need a Senate-confirmed CFO for the stabilization that it provides our department. Um, you heard uh, me testify to the amount of resources that would have been allocated in the emergency supplemental. Uh, that included uh, $20 billion uh, to surge to 50,000 detention beds to hire over 4,000 new asylum officers to uh, attack the backlog. Um, 1,500 new Border Patrol agents and officers. Can you talk for a moment um, about what those kind of resources would have allowed you to do uh, had both Republicans and Democrats come together and supported that bipartisan supplemental package? Chair Murphy, um, uh, my <clears throat> first encounter with the immigration system, the broken immigration system, was in the 1990s when I served as a federal prosecutor in California. And I learned then that the system was fundamentally broken, and it remains so. This piece of bipartisan legislation would have been the most transformative change to our broken immigration system, not only for the resources it provided, but for the changes in the law that it delivered. It would have brought, it would have brought such extraordinary fairness and speed to a system that has suffered backlogs and interminable timelines in the processing of claims. Um, it would have plussed up uh, our personnel um, in an unprecedented fashion, as you have commented. It would have allowed us to adjudicate asylum claims that now take more than seven years to run through the courts in sometimes less than 90 days. Absolutely transformative, not only from an efficiency perspective, but also fundamentally from a security perspective. Let me ask you specifically about <clears throat> how you achieve an increased deterrence. I think there's a perception here that by just loading up on detention beds, you can have an appreciable impact on deterrence. But what the bipartisan bill tried to do, at your and others' urging, was to provide more immediate certainty on asylum claims, to adjudicate those claims in a handful of days or weeks instead of what happens today, five years or 10 years. Now that's just the right thing to do for the country. It's just fair to have that outcome um, at the border rather than 10 years later. But tell us a little bit about the elements of this bill, including that element, that would have had an impact on deterrent, that would have stopped people from ever contemplating the journey to the border and how that can only be achieved by changes in law, not just changes in funding levels. Absolutely, Mr. Chair. So fundamentally, the risk calculus of intending migrants would have changed dramatically because right now what they see is a broken asylum system and they understand that when they are encountered uh, at the border and make a claim for asylum, their claim is ultimately adjudicated sometimes in more than seven years. Our backlog is immense and it's been growing year over year for well more than a, than a decade. And what happens is in those seven years, they work, sometimes they have United States citizen children, and they gain a, a sense of footing in the United States before their claim to stay here has even been adjudicated. Under the bipartisan legislation, that multi-year process would have been transformed to as, as little as 90 days and sometimes even quicker. And given the denial rate for most asylum claims, an intending migrant would have the calculus of deciding, should I take that dangerous journey? Should I place my life savings in the hands of smugglers only to be turned around upon arrival in the United States within 90 days? An absolute game changer. Um, finally, let me uh, ask you about a topic that we've spent a lot of time talking about relative to the fentanyl trade. Um, the fentanyl trade between the United States and Mexico is a circle. Um, fentanyl comes into the United States, <clears throat> money and guns leaves the United States. That is why on a bipartisan basis we have provided additional money for outbound inspections so that we are catching 
not all, but an appreciable amount of guns and money as it leaves the United States. This trade can only work if the guns and the money leaves and the fentanyl comes back. Um, what percentage of traffic today is subject to outbound inspection? And what's a realistic projection for how we're going to expand outbound inspections in this fiscal year? Um, Chair Murphy, I'll have to get the precise uh, numbers to you subsequent to this hearing. But let me say that um, CBP, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and Homeland Security Investigations, the investigative arm of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, are working in tandem to address the outbound flow of both monies, money and guns. In fact, Operation Without a Trace, I uh, will provide the data to you, has been an extraordinarily effective uh, operation uh, to curtail the movement of guns and money. We also have deployed transnational criminal investigative units to Mexico to work uh, with our law enforcement partners in Mexico to address this issue. And we are, are of course, very well and closely aligned with our United States Department of Justice. Great. We'll look forward to that update. Senator Britt. Thank you, Chair Murphy. Mr. Secretary, one of the criticisms we've heard from you repeatedly when it comes to Title 42 expulsions is that expulsion doesn't result in the delivery of a real consequence in the way that deportations or removals do. And removal is, of course, the ultimate consequence for violating our immigration laws. That being the case, do you agree with me that the approximately 1.3 million a illegal aliens in the United States who have received due process and have been given their final orders of removal by an immigration judge should be expeditiously removed from the United States. Ranking Member Britt, I'm not familiar with the, the numeric figure that you cite, but an individual who has been provided due process who has a final order of removal should be removed from the United States. When we adjudicate the fact that they do not have a lawful basis to remain in the United States, they should be removed. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I am so glad we agree on that. Over a three-year period, um, the Biden administration has actually removed fewer people in total. So the first three years, so not the last 11 months, the first three years, removed fewer people in total than both Presidents Obama and Trump removed in each individual year of their administration. So I am hopeful that we can have um, the, the appropriate resources there and we're able to remove the 1.3 million people who have been given due process. And on that note, if you had more ICE officers, more funding for officers there, um, would that be a helpful tool in being able to remove these individuals that have been given their due process? Um, two points, if I may, Ranking Member yes. Britt. In response to your discreet question, the answer is yes. More personnel would assist us, not just the officers and agents themselves, but of course uh, the support personnel upon which they rely. Mm -hmm. But with respect to the data that you cite, I should note that we have removed on a monthly basis more aggravated felons resident in the United States unlawfully than in the prior administration on a monthly basis. Okay. Um, and obviously we're not, we're not talking about felons. We're talking about those people who have been given due process and are set to remove. We need to go ahead and remove them because that serves as a deterrent um, in talking about what we were discussing before. Um, so as you probably are aware um, with respect to due process, the Syracuse University found in 2021 approximately 200,000 immigration court cases were dismissed because DHS failed to file a notice to appear with the court. Are you aware that that number is 12 times higher than the number of cases dismissed for the same reason during all the years before FY24 up till FY2020 combined? Ranking Member Britt, my understanding is that that number may or may not be accurate. So we, we are looking into that, number one. Number two, it is not necessarily that the notice to appear was not filed, but the notice to appear might have had a deficiency. Um, that has been an issue for years in the Department of Homeland Security. And in fact, we have used technology uh, to improve the accuracy and correctness of That's notices to appear. Good. And I think we have data with respect to the success of those notices to appear that is more so current. Do you intend, does DHS intend to reissue the notice to appear in, in those cases? Yes, most certainly. Okay, it is our great. responsibility. Excellent. 
Um, all right, there are more than 7 million um, migrants on that non-detained docket when we were talking about, so double the number at the start of this administration. Um, when you look at that and you look at the record-shattering numbers of people who have entered this country illegally and released into our tier interior, do you believe that that represents an increased risk um, to public safety in this country? I think it is a powerful reflection of an absolutely broken immigration system. And let me share with you a data to evidence the fact that this has been years long in the making. In 2010, the average- I only have, an, only have a minute and 50 seconds left, so I'm, I'm gonna have to continue moving on. But I, I, wa I do wanna say that ICE has detained more than 32,000 um, migrants here with criminal convictions and another 11,000 with pending criminal charges. Some of these criminal records, um, those with criminal records have actually been released by ICE into the United States. And a couple of examples that I wanna make sure uh, we get out there, there have been 4,700 with convictions for assault, 450 of whom have been released. There have been 5,200 with convictions for drug crimes, 261 of which have been released. There have been 1,100 with convictions for weapons crimes, 92 of which have been released. There have been 1,200 with convictions for sexual assault, 46 of whom have been released. And there have been 490 with convictions for homicide, 50 of whom have been released. So I am hopeful that we can agree that when we have this type of chaos at our border, that it does increase the risk um, uh, for our public safety here in the country. And so with my last 42 seconds, uh, I, I do wanna ask you a quick question. Um, when it looks at the CHNV program and what we're seeing, I, we've got some data that says that DHS approved approximately 97.6% of applications that were received under the CHNV program. And so that approval rate to me is indicative of applicants not receiving that individualized case-by-case -case consideration that's required by the law. And your response to that, um, do, do you feel like there is just a blanket um, kind of a blanket gift of the CHNV program into the interior, or do you feel like those have been mindfully looked at individually? Um, Ranking Member uh, Britt, those uh, cases are reviewed on an individualized basis. In response to your uh, earlier point, I look forward to providing you with the data uh, which reflects an increased focus on individuals in the interior of the United States who do not have a lawful basis to stay and who uh, have suffered a criminal conviction. Uh, because our success rate is far uh, greater than in the prior administration. Thank you. S Senator Tester. Uh, thank you, Senator Murray, and I want to thank you for coming for the committee today, uh, uh, Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, look, I, uh, all you have to see is what's gone on on the southern border, and um, you know that we're in a situation that needs immediate repair, immediate fixing, immediate overhaul, whatever you want to call it. Uh, when I visit with the folks in Montana, um, look, it's kind of like a Reagan philosophy for them. Legal immigration, they're okay with. Illegal immigration needs to end and needs to end yesterday. Um, I've made clear that, that both the President, you and Congress, needs to step up to address this problem in a very proactive way, should have done it a long time ago. Uh, we are seeing a high number of encounters at the southern border. Um, we all talk about fentanyl coming into this country. And, and quite honestly, uh, all the way up to the northern border, by the way, it's affected Montana in a big, big way. Uh, this poison is killing a lot of people. Uh, as, a, as, a, as the chairman of this committee pointed out, a couple of months ago, Congress had its opportunity to do something about the southern border and the northern border, I might add, and Montana being a northern border state, that's important, and I think you know that they'll go to the weakest link in defense. And Congress decided to play politics with it, and in the last 60 days, I can tell you, the week after we failed to pass that bill, there were uh, at times where 6,500 people were coming across that border, and they could have been stopped if we would have passed this bill, and we chose not to, to play politics with it. And if you want to see how it's being played politics with, come to Montana and turn on the TV. The fact is the border needs to be fixed, and we need to step up as Congress. The administration needs to step up. You need to step up. And I think if we're able to do that, we can fix it. 
but it's going to take continual due diligence on the border to make it happen. After Congress missed their opportunity to help fix this problem by changing the asylum rule and bringing technology to the southern border and bringing manpower to the southern border, I called on you and, and President Biden to use your executive powers to do whatever you could do to secure that border, as many of my colleagues have talked about here. So my question for you is, does the administration have any plans to use any additional executive powers to address the situation at the southern border? Uh, Senator Tester, um, uh, we continue to consider what additional executive actions we could take uh, that would survive uh, legal scrutiny and have an impact on border security. And I should note uh, that the effort to close the border through executive action is something that the prior administration tried and they were enjoined uh, from doing so. So the real enduring solution is the bipartisan piece of legislation uh, that was negotiated intensely over several months, but we are and continue to look at what executive actions uh, we can take. Well, it's apparent the status quo uh, has not worked and is not working. Uh, currently, and I would also uh, say that uh, this um, this proposal for funding for Homeland Security is inadequate, and we need to work on this. I will say the same thing, by the way, about the Defense Subcommittee budget. It is inadequate. I don't know about the others, but we've got to figure out a way to fix this because the threats at the southern border and the threats we see in the world through the Defense Committee are entirely connected. And so that if we see folks coming across the border, um, you know, they aren't necessarily from the countries we assume they're from. Um, we've had folks that potentially could be terrorist threats, and if they get into the country, it's, it's a problem. So uh, I would call on all my colleagues on the Appropriations Committee to work together in a bipartisan way to try to get these budgets up to a point where they really will do the job that the American people expect in the southern border and the northern border and the Department of Homeland Security, whether it's a hurricane in Louisiana or whether it's people coming across the border, need the resources to get this done. Um, you know, the National Border Council, which represents thousands of border patrol agents to keeps our borders safe, um, they endorsed that bill that, we, that the Congress decided to play politics with two months ago. Um, it said it would drop illegal border crossings nationwide. It would allow our agents to get back to detecting and apprehending those who want to cross our border illegally and evade apprehension. You talked about the border bill and how important it was to get across. Let's just assume for a second in an ideal world that we as Congress people quit taking our instructions from people who want to play politics with policy and actually pass good policy. Is there anything else that needs to be done if we were to pass that border bill that the chairman of this committee and Langford and Sinema negotiated out? That, um, that bipartisan border bill would have been transformative in advancing the security of our border. Anything else need to be done other than that? Um, in the immigration system writ large, uh, the legal immigration system, um, there are many other fixes that need to be made. But from a border security perspective, this was an extraordinary legislative measure. Extraordinary. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a few more questions, but we'll, we'll present for the record. Thank you. And thanks, Senator Murray. Uh, Senator Murkowski. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. Um, I, too, am concerned about the border, as we all are. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you about that other border that's a little uh, harder to, to identify, and, that is, and that's what happens on the waters. I want to talk about the Coast Guard, because I'm concerned about our Coast Guard. We are asking our Coast Guard men and women to do more, to take on more, uh, whether it is, it is trying to, to, to intercept across the southern, in, in the southern waters there, not on land, but in, that, in, in, the, in the border areas on our waters. Um, I note in your, in your testimony before the committee today, you don't ref the, reference the Coast Guard 
at all in your oral comments. You do mention in your written testimony the uh, expansion that the Coast Guard presence will take in the Indo-Pacific region. I recognize that. But I will tell you, Mr. Secretary, I worry. I worry about we, what we are putting on our United States Coast Guard in terms of enhanced mission. In addition to what you want to do in the Indo-Pacific, you've got an Arctic that is wide open and getting wider and more open all the time. And you know that the resources that we have up there to cover that, that huge expanse are, are, are not sufficient. And, and yet, I look at this budget, and I, I'm not sure who's not advocating for our Coast Guard. Sometimes I think our Coast Guard does not advocate for their budget uh, sufficiently enough. But I am very worried about whether or not the Coast Guard actually even belongs in the Department of Homeland Security. Because as I look, I look at your org chart here, a lot, of, a lot of boxes, and here's the Coast Guard hanging out at the very, very bottom, kind of on its own. And then I look at the budget, and I feel like it is, it is, it's, it's almost orphaned within the department. And our reality is, is that the priorities just continue. So let me, let me ask about this. Um, we, are, we are in a place where, uh, again, the demands are even greater. We did not see the Coast Guard included in the President's border or national security supplemental funding request. That disappoints me a great deal. Um, we have seen the Coast Guard resources basically being cannibalized, for lack of a better word, um, for, for funding other agencies within the IHS budget. And, uh, and then again, the budget anticipates an expanded area of emphasis in the Indo-Pacific. Well, I think the efforts in the Arctic are, are, are left languishing. And you know as well as I do the issue with the icebreakers. Um, we were able to prevent another unforced error this, uh, just a couple weeks ago when it comes to meeting the Arctic commitment by securing funding to procure the commercially available icebreaker. That funding had been taken from us in the prior fiscal year, so we had to fight to keep it in. We were successful with that. But we're looking at the polar security cutter line. Admiral Fagan states that the PC, PSC is the top acquisition priority, and yet the FY25 budget reflects zero funding for the program. In fact, the program received a $150 million rescission. We worked hard to limit that. I appreciate working with the chairman on this. She understands very, very well. Um, but again, we've got We've got FY24 rescission. FY25 would have been the second year in a row for funding on that program that would have been paused. So I, I, I would like you to share with the committee whether or not you feel that our Coast Guard is receiving the necessary budget support um, given the increased operations that they face. And, and, and second, if you can speak to to the issue of the icebreakers and whether or not um, the PCS is viewed as a top acquisition priority. Um, and, and, and really, give, give it to me a little more broadly. Does the, are the Coast Guard budgets being reduced at DHS level? Because that's, that's how those of us that are following Coast Guard are feeling. So I'm going to let you talk now. I've taken four minutes. To, to shape it up for you, but please help me out because I'm worried about our Coast Guard. Um, Senator Murkowski, um, I share your concern because in fact, more and more is being asked of the United States Coast Guard and remarkably, uh, they perform more and more every single day. Uh, as this hearing is proceeding, uh, they are in Baltimore uh, responding to the tragic collapse Probably going to be in Louisiana, too. And they will be there as well. And they were in Hawaii on a search and rescue mission following the tragic fires uh, there. Uh, let, me, let me assure you, with respect to your institutional point, I've, I believe very strongly that the United States Coast Guard belongs 
in the Department of Homeland Security from a mission perspective. Number one. Number two, I fight vigorously for the budget for the United States Coast Guard, and uh, I have encouraged the leadership of the Coast Guard across the country, not just in headquarters, for them to fight for the budget uh, as well. I um, can only echo uh, the concerns that you have expressed that uh, the Coast Guard is underfunded, and it is specifically underfunded when it comes to execution of the Arctic strategy. Russia has between 30 and 50 vessels capable of navigating through the Arctic region. They vary in capability, but there are 30 strongly capable vessels, and we fight uh, with two uh, um, antiquated vessels, and yet our Coast Guard personnel work magic with them. Um, I would be eager to work with you to plus up uh, the Coast Guard's uh, budget. Uh, these, you know, we, we work under statutory caps. There are trade-offs, uh, but I would um, welcome the opportunity uh, to work with you to increase the Coast Guard's budget quite, quite significantly. And we're incredibly grateful for, I believe it was $140 million to obtain the commercially available icebreaker. That um, is the tip of the spear of what we need. Well, it's a gap filler. I'd like to talk to you about uh, the one polar uh, class vessel that is in the water. Apparently, Polar Star has suffered some damage. I just learned about this. I don't know what the status is going to be, but it just it's a reminder to me that as an Arctic nation, when we have one operational polar class vessel and it doesn't even get to the Arctic, we are woefully behind. Mr. Chairman, um, I want to work with you on this and what we can do to, to better help our Coast Guard. I know it's important to you as well. No, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Senator Mikowski, for your uh, commitment and vigilance on this issue. Look forward to working with you. Chair Murray. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Secretary. Let me just say I have been very frustrated by recent reports on the overuse of isolation from the general population at ICE facilities, including at Northwest Ice Processing Center in Tacoma. University of Washington researchers found that over the last five years, half of the 10 longest placements in administrative segregation across ICE's national population were at that facility. And I want to stress how concerning it is that ICE continues to use this practice so frequently for so many individuals and reportedly does so without consistent, accurate documentation of its use. What steps has ICE taken to make sure its contractors are following ICE policy on the use of administrative segregation? Uh, Chair Murray, uh, this is a, um, an issue that I am uh, underway in reviewing uh, with uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement with ICE. Um, the, the use of um, segregation uh, sometimes is at the request of the individual detainee, him or herself, by reason of circumstances in a facility. Sometimes it is for the safety and security of our personnel or other detainees. It's a very case-specific issue, but I am meeting with members of the community as well as the workforce, and I just need about three weeks uh, to circle back with you and give you a full report on the path ahead, because I know it is a, a, an issue of concern to you and to others as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I would really like you to commit to an independent investigation conducted by an entity outside of the department to inspect the conditions and practices at that ICE facility in Tacoma. Would you be willing to do that? Uh, I, I would be very pleased um, to consider that. Uh, Chair Murray, if I may, um, we have a, a new um, leader of the Office of the Detention Ombudsman, an office that was created specifically for this purpose. Um, her name is Michelle Branet, um, and I think she would be extraordinarily capable in conducting this review if that would be of, um, satisfactory to you, and I'd be pleased to discuss it with you. Okay. I, I will talk with you about that, but I really strongly caution that ICE um, needs to take these unsafe, inhumane conditions we have seen documented actually over the last two decades very seriously when you consider renewing the contract at that facility. It expires in 2025, and I will continue to talk with you about that. Um, secondly, um, over the last six months, the President has repeatedly sought support from Congress to fund critical needs on our border. 
It's funding that provides a humane environment for some of the most vulnerable people in our hemisphere. It is funding that supports the critical work of the agents and off officers who safeguard our border and critical resources to improve the detection and seizure of narcotics, including fentanyl, uh, preventing these threats from entering our communities. Most recently, that included our bipartisan effort in the Senate that combined both policy changes and new resources. Given the recent FY24 appropriations provided to the department, along with the ever-evolving threats on our border, are there additional resources the department needs in uh, fiscal year 24? Um, there are. Um, uh, Chair Murray, we continue to believe that the resources and the legislative changes uh, that were contained in the bipartisan uh, legislation uh, are greatly needed by our department and would really advance our mission. Okay, thank you. And our committee will work with you on that as we move through this year's process. On a different topic, habitat restoration projects in my home state of Washington and really throughout the country are really key to recovering our endangered species like salmon and upholding our tribal treaty rights. However, the current standards for FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program do not differentiate between requirements for important habitat restoration projects and development projects like a parking lot or a strip mall. So as a result of that, habitat restoration projects that pose minimal risk to people or structures often experience very lengthy permitting delays and millions of dollars in cost increases. In some cases, our local partners have given up on pursuing any kind of habitat projects entirely because of these FEMA rules. How can we work with your office to ensure that these important projects can move forward in a timely and cost-effective manner? Uh, Chair Murray, I am not tracking this discrete issue. Uh, I will um, pay close attention to it and then um, Okay, if we could get back together on that, it's, it's become a real challenge for us. Um, and finally, I know the Senator from Alaska asked you about the Coast Guard, also critical to my state. Um, they are continuing to try to modernize their fleet and replace older vessels um, that are now working far beyond their expected service lives. Many of those programs, like the offshore patrol cutter, require investments in shoreside infrastructure to adequately accommodate their needs. With so many capital investments needs across the service, how does your FY25 budget prioritize those investments to make sure the Coast Guard continues to have the assets and capabilities it needs to execute its mission? Um, Chair Murray, I remember very well when you and I visited a Coast Guard uh, facility in your jurisdiction when I served as the Deputy Secretary. The FY25 budget does provide uh, for um, uh, two uh, additional cutters to begin uh, that process, but I do believe that Senator Murkowski is correct that we need to fund uh, the Coast Guard at a greater level than historically has been the case. Very good, and, and I'll just mention quickly, I'm out of time, but on child care, it's an issue near and dear to me, and we've just provided new authority um, to, for in the 25 report appropriations bill to use operations and support funding across your department to fund and employ emergency backup child care program. If you can get back to me on how that's going to be implemented and how that's going to be used, I would really appreciate it. Most certainly. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Murray. Senator Kennedy. Mr. Secretary, I, um, I don't hate anybody. I look for grace wherever I can find it. And I certainly don't hate you. Uh, my chairman talked about the, uh, the woolly mammoths in the room, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad he, uh, he brought that up. Um, the chairman's immigration bill was negotiated by two members of my party, Senator Langford and Senator McConnell, and I don't, I don't speak for either one. They're both good men. The chairman said that the Republicans who negotiated his bill trusted you and wanted you there. And, and I'm not doubting his word. 
it gives me no joy to say this, but most Republicans don't trust you. And a vast majority of the American people don't trust you. That's why you've been impeached. Now, my Democratic colleagues are going to try to sweep your impeachment under the rug and violate 200 years of Senate precedent in doing it. I, I don't think that they will be able to sweep the issue, maybe your impeachment, but not the issue, under a rug as big as the United States of America. Again, it gives me no joy in saying this. I think m well more than a majority of the American people think that uh, as a result of your behavior and President Biden's behavior, our southern border is an open, bleeding wound. I think they believe that uh, our southern border is chaotic. I think a vast majority of the American people believe that a lot of it is political. I think a vast majority of the American people believe that it is chaotic by design and that, uh, and that, that all of this is intentional. And, and I think a, while a vast majority of, of the American people who don't trust you um, believe in legal immigration, they don't believe in illegal immigration. And they think you do. And they think President Biden does. And they think that's why the border is open. And they think that your attitude and President Biden's attitude is that uh, wh while they may be poorer under President Biden, that they're stupid enough to believe you and the president when you say that it's not your problem. Um, I think that needed to be said. Isn't it a fact, Mr. Secretary, that uh, the number of illegal immigrants that you and the president allow into our country um, counts for congressional district reapportionment? Senator, I'm not sure I understand your question, but I can surely share with you that I disagree with its phrasing. Isn't it true, Mr. Secretary, that the number of illegal immigrants that you and President Biden have allowed into our country uh, counts for allocating electoral votes? I, I, uh, same answer. Okay. You don't know? I, I don't understand um, your question. The, Never crossed the notion, your mind? The notion, Senator, that uh, we uh, intend to allow um, illegal immigration is nothing short of preposterous. So you and do understand my question. And if I may, it is disrespectful to the extraordinarily hard work that we perform and m far more importantly, that the personnel in the Department of Homeland Security and across this administration perform to stem illegal immigration, build lawful, safe, and orderly pathways, and invest in a working system. And we only wish, we only wish that that bipartisan legislation, about which I have not heard a critical term, Mr. President, um, Mr. Secretary, passed. you're using up my time. You do this every single time. You do this every single time. And it's a fact, and you know it, and I know it, that the more people you allow into our country illegally, the more uh, people are counted for reapportionment. And the more people that you allow into our country illegally, the more people are counted for allocating electoral votes. Now, maybe that's a coincidence, but that's a fact. And you know that. And you've done nothing. For four years, nada, zero, absolutely false. zilch. The, 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 and in fact, um, the only people I know in this country who are better off today than they were four years ago are illegal immigrants. And that's as a result of your policy. 
I, I don't hate you for it. I, I, I don't hate anyone. But that's why you've been impeached. And my colleagues may try to cover it up. They're going to try to cover it up. But they can't cover up the facts. I've gone over my time. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Senator Peters. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Secretary Mayorkas. It's uh, wonderful uh, to, to see you here today. And I'm going to see you again uh, next week uh, when you come before uh, my committee, uh, the Homeland uh, and uh, Governmental Affairs uh, Committee. And uh, it's uh, good to have an opportunity to ask your questions. I've always uh, appreciated your candor, uh, your professionalism, and your uh, dedication uh, to the mission. So thank you uh, for the work that you do uh, each, each and every day. Uh, in, uh, in this uh, year's appropriations bill, uh, I was uh, able to secure initial funding uh, with the uh, help of my colleagues uh, here, including uh, great help from uh, Chair uh, Murphy, uh, for the Northern Border Coordination Center. Uh, this uh, center is going to play a, a critical role in coordinating our efforts to better secure our nation's uh, northern uh, border. So my question for you, sir, is how, how does the department plan to use this funding? Uh, to address the threats uh, that exist uh, on our northern border. Um, uh, uh, Chair, uh, Chairman Peters, we're, we're very grateful for the funding and for the concept of the Coordination Center because what it does is it allows us to take a step back and take a look at the northern border writ large and decide where we need to allocate our resources, how we need to allocate it, and make sure that we're being as strategic as well as tactical uh, as possible. Uh, I have asked to meet with our CBP uh, team uh, to get um, uh, the Coordination Center moving, and I've already spoken with the team about how we can use it to recalibrate staffing, because I know you and other uh, senators actually on this committee have expressed concerns with respect to staffing of the northern border. Thank you. Yeah, we definitely uh, have to make sure that uh, we have the the people there and the coordination, so I appreciate uh, your efforts in setting up that uh, center as quickly, uh, quickly as possible. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I was uh, pleased to see the uh, notice of proposed rulemaking published by CISA, as was required by my Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical uh, Infrastructure Act. Uh, this legislation, as you know very well, uh, and the implementing rule will ensure cyber incidents affecting critical infrastructure are reported to CISA so that they can help companies uh, prevent uh, similar uh, attacks. However, FY24 appropriations for this program were set at $24 million below the requested uh, level. So my question for you, uh, sir, is how, how will this funding shortfall impact the department's ability to implement uh, this critical program? And are there other resources uh, necessary in order to execute uh, this rule as was intended by Congress? Chairman Peters, this is a, um, a transformative piece of legislation that is really going to, when implemented, enhance the cybersecurity of our country. Um, I just met with cybersecurity uh, professionals from, countries, uh, from companies all over the country yesterday to talk about the notice of proposed rulemaking that we issued and to solicit um, their feedback on the CERCIA implementation. Um, one of the responsibilities that we are going to have as a department is to actually receive the cyber incident reports, to be able to uh, really analyze them and assess them and communicate to the, to the community, the public and the private community, our findings and our best practices. To fund us insufficiently is really going to handicap our ability to realize the full benefits of this transformative legislation. We do need to be properly resourced here. It is a very significant undertaking. Right. Well, we're going to work to make sure that that happens. I, uh, I totally concur uh, with you. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Senator Murkowski, uh, uh, as well as uh, Chair Murray, uh, uh, share their concerns uh, about Coast Guard funding, particularly with infrastructure, icebreakers and cutters, et cetera. Uh, but as you well know, uh, Coast Guard plays a, a vital role uh, in the Great Lakes uh, as well. And unfortunately, the Coast Guard is facing personnel shortages that are impacting uh, their activities uh, in the lakes. For example, personnel shortages uh, recently hindered essential, essential operations at seven small boat stations uh, uh, along the coast uh, in Michigan. So my question for you, uh, Mr. Secretary, does, does the President's budget include necessary resources to address the Coast Guard's workforce challenges? 
and ensure that it has personnel that are absolutely needed to effectively serve Michigan as well as the entire Great Lakes region. Um, Chairman Peters, I've got to take a look at the budget and confer with Coast Guard about uh, the implications of the budget for um, uh, Michigan specifically and the facilities that the Coast Guard staffs there. Uh, forgive me for not, under, for not knowing today the ge that, that geographic specificity, but I will circle back with you. I appreciate that, and we, we can uh, follow up with you. Uh, finally, uh, I was pleased that uh, Congress uh, provided TSA uh, with sustained funding to ensure that TSA frontline staff uh, receive the pay and benefits uh, equivalent to counterparts uh, throughout the federal government. The department's FY25 budget request, if granted, would ensure that TSA personnel continue to receive equivalent pay and benefits, and I look forward to working uh, with my colleagues to deliver to TSA the the pay and those benefits that they deserve as they keep us safe every single day at airports uh, across our country. My question for you, sir, is as TSA continues to screen record, record numbers of passengers, how does this uh, pay increase improve TSA's operations, workforce morale and retention, as well as your recruitment efforts? Um, uh, I have spoken with um, the administrator, David Pekoski, on a number of occasions. Uh, the pay increase has had a monumental impact positively, of course, on both recruiting and retention, as well as, of course, uh, morale. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Peters. Senator Hyde-Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Mayorkas, it's my understanding that the delivery of the first polar security cutter originally planned for 2024 may now occur no earlier than 2028 due to delays. The committee also has concerns regarding the accuracy of the polar security cutter's estimated procurement cost. Given its size and complexity, it's a, it's a lot of moving parts there. However, I'm hearing great progress is being made right now between the shipbuilder in my state and the Coast Guard in getting the security the uh, security cutter program on track. This is very good news since the uh, Russian Ice-breaking fleet is the largest in the world, and the U.S. only has one. Nearly 50-year-old operational heavy icebreaker. The success of this program is very vital to our national security and economic interest in the Arctic region. I hope the Department and the Coast Guard are working to support the shipbuilder, however possible, so we may get these assets into the fleet as soon as possible. With that being said, I'd like to uh, receive assurance that prog progress will continue to be made. So please give me your position on the status of this program. Uh, Senator Hyde-Smith, I am familiar with the challenges that we have had with the development and, and execution of the contract for the Polar Security Cutter. We are fully invested in that polar security cutter. Uh, it is, for the reasons you identify, very important to the United States Coast Guard, to our Arctic strategy, to our national security. Um, and we are working very closely with the contractor uh, to make this uh, relationship work and deliver that polar security cutter as quickly as possible. We are fully vested in it. Thank you for that. and. Um the U.S. Coast Guard in September 2023 informed me of what it calls temporary operational workforce adjustments across the nation in response to its workforce shortfall, reported at nearly 10 percent at that time. This included the temporary reduction of capabilities and workforce at Coast Guard Station Pascagoula in Mississippi. I have been assured that its search and rescue capabilities remain sufficient and that it is only temporary, but I question whether that is realistic. As recently as last Wednesday, the uh, Commandant stated that the Coast Guard should expect to see additional adjustments due to personnel shortages that will limit its ability to conduct its congressionally directed missions. The Coast Guard has missed its recruiting goals for the last four years, and while I recognize that this issue has spread to nearly all of our armed services, the Coast Guard's failures are what I want to hear about from you today. 
There's significant requests for funding to support recruiting and retention initiatives in the President's budget request, but I would like your thoughts on the root causes of this workforce retention crisis. What steps are you taking to address the concerns of the young Americans when they see how some of our service members were treated when they were ordered to receive a vaccine that violated their religious beliefs? What about when they hear from their veterans and their families and friends of the unnecessary woke agenda of many senior leaders? This is a messaging and cultural problem at the very least, but I want to know if you have even begun to address these issues rather than just throw money at them. Um, Senator Hyde-Smith, I am working with leadership across the department uh, on strategies for recruiting and retention of our personnel. You correctly identify uh, the recruiting challenges that the different branches of the military uh, are experiencing, and it's not um, exclusive to the military. I, I speak with law enforcement leaders on a regular basis in different parts of the country, and it's uh, a difficult recruiting and retention environment for law enforcement as well. We, we do need funding um, so that we can engage in the recruiting efforts um, that are needed and we are looking at creative ways to recruit uh, young people to both the Coast Guard and our law enforcement agencies within the Department of Homeland Security. Can you give me some examples of what you're actively doing now? Can you describe what you're doing? Let me, uh, if I may, uh, uh, give you one, uh, one precise example. We're taking a look at what our presence is and is not on university, college and university campuses. Uh, what our education programs are like in high schools around the country to sensitize people about the valor and nobility of public service in the United States Coast Guard, in our law enforcement agencies, and really, you know, have a, a physical presence there to recruit them. That's one of the um, elements uh, of the effort. I think I'm out of town. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, the work that our Customs and Border uh, Protection and Homeland Security do at our southern border is essentially is essential to keeping uh, families across the country and in Wisconsin safe. Um, I am eager to discuss how appropriators can continue to support this critical mission. So between 2019 and 2021, opioid overdose deaths in Wisconsin grew by a staggering 97%, um, in no small part due to synthetic fentanyl. Uh, in February, uh, the Senate passed the Fend Off Fentanyl Act, a bipartisan bill that I co-sponsored to help protect our communities from the damaging effects of fentanyl and illicit substances crossing our borders. I was also proud to vote to advance the bipartisan uh, border security bill that would have, among other things, invested in high-tech border security, uh, disrupted the deadly flow of fentanyl into our country, and ensured that Wisconsin communities receiving migrants have the resources they need. And I was sorely disappointed to see partisan politics uh, take hold and the Senate ultimately did not uh, pass the bipartisan compromise that we so urgently need. Secretary Mayorkas, I know you've gotten another topic or question on this topic uh, before I was able to return from presiding on the floor, but I'd like to give you another opportunity to speak specifically to how uh, this bill that we didn't pass, but that was negotiated over months, would have bolstered your efforts and the resources that you need to secure the border and stem the flow specifically of fentanyl uh, coming into this country. Um, can you please speak to that? Thank you, Senator. Um, uh, we have um, interdicted uh, more fentanyl in the past two years than in the last five prior five years combined. We have arrested more individuals. That requires not only a dedication of personnel and effective strategies, but also the ability to harness technological advancements, most notably the non-intrusive inspection technology. The importance of funding personnel is not only 
um, uh, to secure our ports of entry where 90% or more of the fentanyl is smuggled in commercial trucks and passenger vehicles, but also to be able to deploy people in the international arena to plus up our transnational criminal investigative units in different countries in Latin America to deploy individuals in different parts of the world to work with uh, our allies. But the bipartisan, or I should say, and the bipartisan legislation would have given us funds for that technology, would have given us funds for our personnel, would have been transformative in plussing up our capability to interdict more fentanyl and address uh, the smugglers and traffickers that deal in death. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. I want to switch to uh, a different topic, but that bears on certainly the, the fentanyl issue. Our current trade policy allows nearly 3 million packages into the United States daily, and almost none are inspected. So long as the shipper claims that the value of the product is less than $800. Our trade policy is being abused. It's being abused by uh, companies from China that make products with forced labor or sell counterfeit goods, uh, wreaking havoc on American manufacturers and retailers. Worse, the loophole is used to ship fentanyl and its precursor chemicals directly into American communities, killing children and tearing families apart. I've authored legislation to lower the $800 threshold and to bar China from using this so-called de minimis channel. However, if Chinese exporters simply lie about the origin of their shipment or its contents, it doesn't matter what threshold Congress ultimately sets. The shipments will keep coming in and the destruction will continue. We need uh, CBP to dramatically improve its inspection of shipments to protect our communities. And our fiscal year 2024 appropriations bills calls on you to do just that. So what steps are you taking to use your existing authorities to address this issue? And how can this committee help? Senator, I share your concerns with respect to the de minimis uh, exception. There are three lines of effort that I have undertaken specifically. One is, for the first time, um, engage with my counterpart, counterpart from the People's Republic of China about the scourge of fentanyl and the fact that China is a source country for the precursor chemicals and the pill presses and other equipment used to manufacture it, number one. Number two, um, I think it was yesterday, it might have been the day before, um, uh, I spoke with the textile industry and spoke to them about our new enforcement plan uh, that I outlined and announced with respect to the de minimis exception and the law enforcement strategies that we are employing to increase our impact on the reality that drugs and other contraband are making way, their way through uh, uh, packages uh, valued either accurately or inaccurately at lower than $800 in value. And third, we're taking a look at how we can harness artificial intelligence to be a force multiplier of our personnel. Senator Cabot. Thank you, uh, Chairman Murphy. And uh, it's nice to be back in the Homeland uh, Security Subcommittee. And great to see Senator Britt there with you. You'll be bo both be great partners. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being a good partner when I was a ranking member. So I appreciate that. Uh, and welcome, Mr. Secretary. Um, I'm just going to cut kind of to the chase here because this is always something when I was uh, had the had the lead uh, on our side uh, is the number of border agents. Uh, we're always putting more money in. We put uh, more money in this last time for 150 new border agents. In 2025, request asked for 250 more, 150 officers to staff ports of entry, 135 um, processing coordinators. I would like to say, just as a statement, that I don't think the solution to the border issue and to bringing these astronomical numbers down is to just keep adding more people to process more people, because that obviously is not going to have the desired result. But I would like to know um, 
uh, with the significant amount of funding that you were that you were granted, what is the number of border agents right now? Is it going up? Is it at your max? What's your you're allowed to have twenty one thousand three hundred and seventy, I believe. So where are you on that? Uh, um, we we are hiring uh, actively, Senator Capito. I will have to get to you the specific number. I concur with you that it's not just personnel that is going to solve uh, the challenge at our southern border, which is why the bipartisan legislation not only included additional resources, but also fundamentally needed legislative changes that would have really changed the system and the number of people we encounter in the first instance. Yeah, how's the morale and retention? I mean, is that an issue? Obviously, when you were trying to recruit, it's got to be. Uh, morale has uh, uh, been a, uh, an issue in our Department of Homeland Security uh, ever since I joined it and, and well before then. We are very focused on workforce well-being and are hoping uh, that um, uh, the well-being of our um, treasured employees uh, is actually strengthening and improving despite the stresses and the strains they undergo in their very difficult work. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm assuming, I would assume that you would know whether you were close to your peak to the allowable amount of agents. I mean, are you close to that number, or are you far away? Are you losing more people we, than we, you're gaining? We, we are. Give me a sense are, of that. We are close. We are close, but I, I don't want to misspeak and cite a, a figure uh, that would not be accurate to you, and I will provide that to you with, All right, we'll with, follow with up. swiftness. We'll follow up. Um, I do have a question about, about the drugs and also the um, um, uh, surveillance. Uh, automated surveillance, but I do I do want to get to this one for my seven airports that lost your uh, uh, TSA law enforcement reimbursement uh, program, where all commercial all of our seven commercial airports relied on for various um, law enforcement services. Small airports just aren't able to provide this the manpower here, and obviously we were relying on this. Um, what do you say to those airports across the country where this was cut? They now have and $150,000 budgets and holes in their budgets to try to do this. What, what was the reasoning behind that? Certainly doesn't sound like a safety issue. It doesn't sound like it's making our airports more safe. No, the, uh, I, I think, Senator, uh, are you speaking of the fact that we sometimes rely on smaller airports to provide uh, the security personnel instead of us? Yes. Yes. Um, with respect to the airports in your jurisdiction, I'll have to follow up with mm -hmm. you on that. Um, from a fundamental policy perspective, if we had the resources, we would devote the personnel to Well, apparently you have had the resources in the past, and, and th these were just cut this year. Uh, right. our, our airport was notified uh, maybe a month ago, maybe when we passed this last bill, that, our, uh, that their help with law enforcement agent. So I, that would be like if somebody's coming through TSA and there's a gun uh, in, in a backpack found, for instance. Um, that law enforcement agent then would come in and, and help the TSA um, do whatever the local law enforcement would be doing. And, and, and apparently we're missing that. And it seems like a pretty cr critical aspect. Senator, I addressed this issue last year, I believe. Uh, I am uh, disappointed to hear uh, that it remains an issue. Mm -hmm. and I will circle back with okay. you after I address it internally. Okay, thank you. Uh, on the, um, I know Senator Baldwin asked about uh, fentanyl and uh, really concerned about what we see going on there. But I, and so I don't want to act like that's a de minimis question. It's not. But this autonomous surveillance towers issue is something I think would be helpful if you've got manpower shortages. If people are coming between the ports, they obviously are. Um, apparently, your budget has is not reflected any kind of plus up in that area that would fortify and help us uh, interdict in those areas. What, what's your position on uh, the autonomous surveillance towers and how helpful they have been and would be as force multipliers? Um, um, Senator, they, the automated uh, surveillance towers, the ASTs, have been force multipliers. They have been effective. Uh, we are focusing right now our resources on the non-intrusive inspection technology, given the fact that the great majority of fentanyl that is smuggled uh, into our country comes in through the ports of entry in commercial trucks and passenger vehicles. Mm -hmm. I think you told me last time that the, uh, I did ask about how, how many trucks were being uh, uh, interdicted, or I mean inspected, and you noted that 70%, but you didn't give me an exact figure at that time. Uh, let's see, what percentage of cars are actually screened for drugs coming through the ports of entry? 
Do you have an update on that, or does that sound like the same figure as last year, or has it gone up? I think I was. I apologize, Senator. I'll get you that uh, data. Okay, I'm striking out here. All right, thank you. Actually, I am. Senator Shaheen. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here today and for your testimony. Um, as you know, and you may have already addressed this since I missed much of um, the questioning, but as you know, the national security supplemental that was introduced last fall included a billion dollars that was um, to be used for fentanyl interdiction. Um, most of this would have gone to non-intrusive inspection technology. As you point out, most of the fentanyl that's coming in is coming in at ports of entry. Um, sadly, because Donald Trump came out against the very excellent bipartisan package that was negotiated by Chair Murphy and others, um, the Senate uh, failed to pass that and dropped out the billion dollars that would have helped with fentanyl interdiction. So can you talk about how the lack of those supplemental funds are going to affect our ability to find fentanyl and other drugs at the border? Senator Shaheen, the, um, the bipartisan legislation would have resourced us so significantly to address not only um, the number of individuals encountered at our southern border, to be able to process them, process them more expeditiously for removal, but it would have um, also been transformative in terms of our ability to detect, interdict, and prosecute uh, the attempted smuggling of fentanyl, uh, because 90 percent or more of it comes through the ports of entry, and the ability to operationalize the latest technology at every single port of entry would have been extraordinarily significant. Yes, it's very disappointing that um, that became a political campaign issue rather than something in the best interests of the country. Um, Secretary Mayorkas, the last time you were before this committee, we discussed um, my interest in getting data on the numbers of migrants who have come across our northern border in New Hampshire. Um, and you committed to working with me on this. This is a, an issue that I have heard both from law enforcement in my state as well as um, other organizations like the ACLU. And unfortunately, the agency didn't provide our office with this information for a number of months. You've, and I have had several conversations about this, I think, um, waiting to share it until weeks after it released the same information publicly to the New Hampshire ACLU, which would have been fine with me, except that the numbers that were released publicly to the ACLU are not the same numbers that the staff released to my office. And in fact, we heard from your staff, or staff at the Homeland Security, who indicated that the numbers that were provided to our office were likely less accurate than those released by the agency, and that, in fact, um, there is a different number than both of those that is now listed on CBP's public portal. So help me understand how this happens and what we can do to address it so we have the same information that's available to our office and to the local community so they have reliable information that they need in order to address concerns at the northern border. Uh, Senator, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear uh, your concerns with respect to both the timeliness and accuracy of the data we have provided to you and disseminated more broadly. I will look into that very quickly, very quickly. Thank you. I will hear from you by the end of the month, by the beginning, oh, middle of the Oh, you'll hear from me before the end of the month. Thank you. I appreciate I, I that. I was just worried you were going to say before the end of the week, uh, but I will respond to you. I'll give you a little leeway on that. Um, in January, we had a severe winter storm that damaged the Coast Guard facility in Newcastle, New Hampshire, so that now the Coast Guard no longer has berths for all its vessels. Um, I appreciate the funding issues that um, exist with trying to repair and replace facilities like the Coast Guard um, birth, but it, it's a real challenge and a concern. I know that they are now looking at potential um, facilities to lease, but that's not a long-term solution. So can you um, work with our office with the Coast Guard and, and help us 
figure out what we can do to ensure that the Coast Guard has what they need um, to continue to operate in New Hampshire. I most certainly will. Thank you. They are, they are important, not just to maritime safety and security, but also to environmental missions in the state. Um, and in light of the tragic events in Baltimore, Baltimore, do you know if the Coast Guard is doing anything to address the potential for those kinds of events to happen in other um, ports along the uh, seacoast? Um, uh, Senator, it's not only the Coast Guard uh, that is looking at this, but we are, as a department, are one of, one of the, um, uh, one of our areas of focus, or two areas of focus, on the one hand is port security, um, writ large, right. and on the other is the resiliency of our supply chains, which obviously are impacted by the tragedy in Baltimore. So we are looking at that from a number of different perspectives. Uh, a physical uh, disaster, such as the one that the Baltimore uh, um, a bridge suffered, but also cyber attacks uh, and other threat streams. So we are indeed taking a holistic view uh, of the situation. Well, thank you, and fortunately, we didn't have the same kind of catastrophe in New Hampshire or in Boston, but we've had similar accidents um, affect both the Memorial Bridge in New Hampshire and the Tobin Bridge in Boston that have shut down traffic for significant periods of time. So um, unfortunately, as we know, this is not an isolated incident, even though the drama of what happened in Baltimore is certainly worse than we've seen in some other places. Um, and just finally, one of the provisions that was in that negotiated border bill that was important to us in New Hampshire with the northern border was the Stone Garden funds, which um, are reduced in the budget bills that just passed. Um, but in addition to the funding being reduced, there were provisions in the um, the border bill that would have committed to a certain percentage going to non-Southwest border states. Again, um, an issue that is important to us, even though we don't have the challenges at our northern border that we do at our southern border, there are still issues around um, law enforcement and communications that um, the Stone Garden funds have been critical to helping us with. So can, will you commit that um, you will take a look at the funding that has been passed and see if we can ensure that the northern border states also receive a proportionate share of those funds. Uh, I, will, I will, Senator, and I was very disappointed to see a reduction in the Stone Garden funds. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Shaheen. Senator Britton, I have a few wrap-up questions, and then we'll get you on your way. Senator Britt. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, when we look at the number of uh, individuals that are detained by ICE. Uh, roughly on average, there's been about 39,000 detained this year. My question goes to the FY24 appropriations bill that was passed um, a few weeks ago and the funding level that was um, submitted there and, and passed for detention. Um, is that something that we need to continue, in, in your opinion, for FY25 um, to allow you to be able to detain the number of individuals you need to? Yes, Senator. Thank you very much. When you look um, at encounters, obviously, coming across the, the border, um, we know there's been a lot of discussion about known gotaways and people that we've seen, but we don't know who they are, where they're going, or, or what their intentions are. The FBI director warned that he is increasingly concerned that terrorists may seek um, that opportunity to, to enter the U.S. and He's concerned about what that does in the interior of our homeland. And so I know that that's something that you probably pay close attention to as well. Um, is that something that you agree with? Uh, just when we look at what's happening in the interior, it just increases, it increases threats across the homeland. We are indeed very concerned about it. Um, uh, the safety and security of the American people is our highest priority. The bipartisan legislation would have provided us yeah. with additional staffing that would have strengthened the security of the yeah. southern border. Yeah, and I really, look, I am a big believer we've got to do our job right now. And so as I look at FY25, it is my goal to make sure that we get these dollars in the exact right place possible. I would love to see Congress start to do our job 
on time. I think that the American people deserve it, and I think every time we drag our feet, they're the ones that pay the price. You know, the last time that we actually passed all 12 bills on time was 1997. Um, I think it's not only fiscally irresponsible, I think it's morally irresponsible. I think you need to know what your budget is, and I think when you look at something like a supplemental, you have to actually have base funding first. So my goal right now is to make sure that in FY25, we stretch every dollar we put it where it matters. Um, we put it where it can help you and help um, the courageous men and women that work in the Department of Homeland Security do their jobs. So I am, I am laser focused on that. And in that, I really do appreciate the work that CBP and ICE have done um, in their seizures. I think they've grown when it comes to fentanyl and other illicit drugs. They continue to seize more and more, um, which obviously we know that that means that's less that, that can get into our homeland. However, I know we can't simply seize our way out of it. And so would love to know from you uh, where where would be best to direct dollars? You know, what are you doing to actually disrupt and dismantle that transnational criminal organizations and kind of the flow of that? And is there a place, maybe more HSI agents um, and others that would help um, disrupt that even more? Um, Ranking Member uh, Britt, more personnel okay. is certainly one element of the answer. More HSI agents, more support personnel for the agents, more Customs and Border Protection officers and agents, okay. um, more funding for technology. I am listing the different things that the bipartisan legislation would have delivered. Okay. When we look at the Coast Guard, I strongly support the Coast Guard and I'm proud that Mobile is the home of the Coast Guard Aviation Training Center and I'm very proud of the offshore patrol cutter being built in Alabama. However, that's just one of the pieces of a very large Coast Guard shipbuilding strategy. I'm concerned with many other Coast Guard acquisition programs which seem to be plagued with various issues. I am especially concerned about the status of the Waterways Commerce Co Cutter program and the Polar Security Cutter program, which have been faced with significant delays in recent years. I know that you've heard a number of my colleagues speak about this on both sides of the aisle. And I, I'm just taking a look at it. Um, you look at the Waterways Commerce Cutter, which was intended by Congress to be a small business shipbuilding program. It's faced legal challenges and other significant contracting challenges in recent months. And as the daughter of two small business owners, I think it is important to me that our entire defense base, particularly as it pertains to shipbuilding, that they're giving consideration um, and given every fair opportunity to compete. And I think that that's what we need when we look at things that have just come down and um, the naval intelligence that was just declassified looking at the shipbuilding of China saying they can shipbuild 232 times faster than we can. I think that as many people as we have um, encouraging that, particularly from a small business perspective, I think that's better for America. So Mr. Secretary, will you commit to engaging your Coast Guard leadership and looking into the current state of play when it comes to the Waterways Commerce Cutter program and what options should be considered, even if it means recompeting the program to ensure the Coast Guard receives the shipbuilding assets they need in a timely manner and um, cost-effective schedule. Thank you, Member Britt. I certainly will engage with the Coast Guard. Thank you. And look at this program and, and, and be in touch with you. I really appreciate that. And one last thing, um, when we look at the alleged killer of Lake and Riley who entered the United States illegally in 2022 and then was released under DHS under a grant of parole. I'm sure your department has taken a look at that and can you explain what specific either humanitarian reason or reason of significant public benefit, as you all know, one of those two things had to be used to authorize his release into the country. Um, can you explain that for, for this panel as well? Um, Ranking Member Britt, we were, um, there was no derogatory information of, uh, of which we were aware in our holdings uh, to compel the detention of this individual. It's a tragic circumstance. Our hearts break. I know all our hearts break for the family of, of Ms. Riley, and uh, we expect that the individual will be prosecuted correctly to the fullest extent of the law. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate that. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Britt. Two uh, final parochial questions for you. One, uh, relative to the U.S. Uh, Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. Um, <clears throat> last time I was there, I was talking to cadets um, about a really serious need to upgrade uh, the Academy's living quarters, specifically um, in the old Chase Hall barracks, its oldest section, uh, Annex A. This was um, built in the 1930s, requires some really significant asbestos abatement, um, but also there's a lot of stories of non-functioning heating, ventilation, air conditioning. You were having a conversation earlier with Senator Hyde-Smith about the difficulty of recruitment, and obviously one of the ways that we convince young men and women to come join the Coast Guard is to make sure that they have uh, adequate living conditions. So I was um, a little worried to see uh, that this was um, not um, in the request, the upgrade of uh, Annex A. Um, it's in the unfunded priorities list. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, I assume that you, know, you care deeply about the living conditions of the US, U.S. Coast Guard Academy and just ask uh, for your commitment to work with us on making sure that this project gets funded expeditiously. Most certainly. And, and thank you for that. Uh, and then lastly, I'm sure she's going to submit the question for the record, but uh, I will just note that Senator Collins did in her opening statement uh, ask you a, a question regarding uh, CBP staffing of international cruise ship arrivals, and I'll just ask you to add that to those questions that you take for the record and hopefully have a response to Senator Collins um, sometime next week. Um, with that, uh, we are going to keep... The record open for a week. That means we'll ask that uh, any additional questions from uh, colleagues on the committee be in uh, by the end of the day next Wednesday. And with that, this hearing stands adjourned.